looking at different uh, communities and travel councils and PTOs about uh, uh, just trying to clarify um, the legal gaps that are in what the provinces and the federal governments thought was sort of a watertight legalization regime and some of the things that they have forgotten and the most important thing that they have forgotten is they have a treaty relationship with us. Jobs in cannabis industry. The folks who work in licensed productions who are cultivating and producing cannabis have good jobs. These are jobs of you know, good salaries of seventy, seventy-five thousand um, dollars, and there are some good professions. And actually, in some of the dispensaries, you do see people do you see people there that have gone to school around medical cannabis, and they believe they're very much a believer that cannabis is a solution for First Nations health health issues. The the cannabis regime set up by the federal and provincial governments is only about recreational cannabis. And what's happening outside of that, with the dispensaries and such, I'm also going to mention that as well because there's been some misperceptions about what the law was before October 17, uh, 2018. And so I'm going to explain some of that. I'm also going to explain the importance of us getting this jurisdictional challenge right. What tool we use um, is important. And uh, some of you in the room, might have remembered our gaming challenges. And in 1996, after a long uh, challenge to the courts about gaming jurisdiction, the Supreme Court of Canada created a very um, difficult ruling uh, around uh, gaming in Ontario involving uh, Shawanaga and Eagle Lake First Nations, uh, called uh, R in Kamajuan. And that case, for a lawyer for me, it stands for the idea that um, you cannot assert just the right to govern generally. You have to focus very much on the subject matter, what you're trying to govern, and go through that awful Vanderpeet test of proving that since time immemorial, or at least since the Europeans came, that you've, you've been governing or governing a subject matter that's been integral to your culture. And that's very difficult to do around cannabis. Due to the fact that there's actually consultation that should be happening in communities around edibles and extracts. I don't know if that's happening, I doubt very much it has happened, but that should be happening now. First Nation should be being consulted about the policy in 2019, the law that's going to change, about having legal, legalizing extracts and edibles for recreational cannabis use. And if that's not happening, you should probably be talking to your local MP because that's the federal government that's doing that consultation. And the provinces thought they created uh, in 2016-2017 to legalize recreational use of cannabis. And what they thought they would do is very much what they did with gaming. That before in the criminal code, running a gaming house was illegal. Until Canada and the provinces made a bargain, and this was largely around um, big sporting events like, uh, I think it was the Olympics, it was the Olympics or some kind of uh, Canada Games that was happening. And uh, t in order to pay for that big uh, event, uh, gaming was the solution. And so the provinces created provincial gaming regimes. And how successful have we been as communities uh, participating in the license regime under the province of Ontario? Not that successful until we had a friendly NDP government. And so this same type of regime happened with cannabis. Under the criminal code, um, having uh, illicit, ca illicit cannabis in your possession is still illegal, but now there is a legalized form of cannabis to a certain quantity that you can possess and consume legally for recreational purposes. So that's the way the law has changed and the provinces have the authority to license this regime. And that's what they are doing under what's called the Alcohol and Gaming Authority or the AGCO. And that's where you're seeing all the rules coming out about uh, cannabis stores, for example. So this is, this is all happening and, uh, and First Nations are saying, we're gonna, we're gonna probably see a lot of the impacts, but see very, very few benefits.
from this legalized regime. Section of the Federal Cannabis Act that delegates licensing authority to the provinces. So if you're looking for sort of the mischief in all of this, the problem with all of this is that the federal government could have said provinces and First Nations or, or provinces and indigenous governments uh, but they just restricted the licensing authority solely to the provinces and put some requirements on the provinces when they create their regimes. And uh, one of the things that's posing a problem for all the pro provinces is that in this regime, the supply of all the cannabis comes from a Health Canada licensed producer. So does anybody know what's going on because of that? in the recreational cannabis market. What's happening? Not enough. Shortage. Big time shortage across the country, in every province, in every retail store that's in, that exists in other provinces. Of course, we don't have licensed retail stores in Ontario yet. There are empty shelves. Because there are only so many licensed producers, and they're not producing just for the uh, retail, for the uh, recreational market, they're also uh, themselves as a as a business um, producing medical cannabis for their clients. So there was also there was already a market for uh, people who had prescriptions for medical cannabis to get a medical cannabis directly from these licensed producers through online sales, and that has been a ready and steady market for them. And so uh, the provinces have been uh, do. Uh, requesting proposals from these licensed producers to supply uh, the provinces with uh, legal cannabis and um, it's been less than successful and that's the problem but that's in this section of the federal cannabis act that they have to all the provinces and the regimes have to supply their cannabis from health canada licensed licensed producers so what happened on October 17th, a lot of people thought there was going to be a lot of uh, issues and problems. I don't know if you've noticed any major changes. I haven't noticed any major changes. I live in Toronto. I mean, you still smell the stuff. I smell the stuff in my condo building. Um, you know, I hear a lot more people talk about, oh, I got so high last night you know, on the streetcar. But beyond that, I haven't really... I haven't really seen any major changes. And I don't know if you know this, but the Ontario Cannabis Store, who's the only entity, the only business that is selling cannabis in Ontario legally, is not making any money. So there are problems. And so the only way to get recreational cannabis right now to April 1st in Ontario to get legal cannabis is through the Ontario Cannabis Store. It's legal now, so it, has anybody done that? Anybody? I've, I've, I've done it. I haven't smoked it, though. <laughs> but, believe me. Believe me. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a wonderful, um, uh, for anybody that has sleep difficulties, uh, there, there are some wonderful products, like, and you'll, you'll hear that. There's a wonderful CBD tea that I, I've used through prescription. Um, for the last six months that helps me sleep and, and you'll see more and more people talking openly about it because it's legal now. Um, medical cannabis of course was legal before. Um, on April 1, 2019 we were going to see some stores only in the major centers. So there was this lottery that happened. I helped a couple First Nation uh, economic development entities uh, bid or sue the lottery. We were very prepared, and um, unfortunately, there are probably more than a few of those 25 soul or 25 entities that did get stores that probably were less prepared than us, uh, because it's a very difficult process. They were told on July um, 11th that they could open up a store, or sorry, January 11th. January 11th, they were told because they won the lottery and they're given the opportunity to open up a store. There are going to be 25 stores opening up on April 1st, hopefully. Um, everybody and their hippie uncle could 
have applied to this lottery, and I think a few hippie uncles actually won. Um, so we're going to see um, some problems. One of the things that you had to commit to was to be ready to open a store in April 1. Not only do you have to find which cities actually allow it, we just heard yesterday which cities won't allow it or aren't opting in. You have to make sure that that city has a population of 50,000 or more, and you have to open the doors on April 1. And there are also all kinds of regulatory restrictions about the, the store has to just be a cannabis store. You can sell some other pro cannabis related products, but you have to be fully enclosed. You have to make sure that you have different systems in there for security. You have to buy into the tracking system, buy into the training. It's a very expensive process and some very lucky people, or maybe unlucky people, won the lottery and have to do this all before April 1. Um, my team, we had uh, myself, another partner, and three associates ready to help with one of the First Nations that I was working for already. Like we, we had a, a big team behind us just in case uh, one, of, one of our clients won the lottery. Unfortunately, none of them did. Uh, none of them were even waitlisted. We also know that there are dispensaries operating, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to take questions after this, but um, we can talk about that. As a lawyer, I say they're illegal, and that's be a lawyer talk. Um, but I understand the importance of entrepreneurism, I understand the importance of economic opportunity, and I understand why there are dispensaries open in First Nations, um, because there is an opportunity. Uh, but what they're selling and what you're buying is legally illicit cannabis. And that still brings you under the Cannabis Act, federal law. You know, on reserve, off reserve, federal law applies, and uh, you can be charged with having it in your possession. And uh, the other problem too, and you know, politicians in the room know this, is that some police forces have been given some uh, some um, extra resources to deal with this, the issues around cannabis, and some have not yet. So there's a problem there as well. Ontario for Recreational Cannabis is the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario. So this is where you get your gaming licenses, bingo licenses if you're operating uh, outside of First Nation jurisdiction um, and uh, dealing with uh, tobacco issues. Um, they're setting up the standards. They've set up some standards. Uh, they changed the rules on December 13, 2018 to um, restrict a phase one of 25 stores um, from April 1 to as long as December 31st, 2019. We may only see those stores be the only stores that are open until that time because of the supply issue. I also think that there's a bit of self-interest for the province of Ontario to, to try to um, persuade you to go to the online store and purchase your products there uh, because they own that, that entity. Um, the AGO, AGCO website hosted this lottery process, so I took part in that and uh, of course the system crashed. <laughs> And, um, but but it, it worked so that uh, there was, I, I think there was thousands of applicants for these 25 stores. And, um, and uh, the 25 that were, that were awarded stores are now working busily, I'm sure, uh, trying to get ready, following the rules. And there are lots and lots of rules about retail stores, following the rules to open the stores on April 1. We will learn shortly, I think, the end of January, where the uh, proposals are going to be uh, for the different cities that will get one of these 25 stores. And uh, it's up to the, the, the lottery winners to decide. So of course there are going to be two stores in the north, and, it's, and it can only be uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Sudbury, North Bay, or Thunder Bay. So one of those four will get. And there's nothing saying that North Bay might not get both, two, both of them. And there's nothing saying that Thunder Bay won't get both of them. Because the, it's the, the lottery winners who decide where they want to go. The municipalities themselves have had a one-time option. The deadline was yesterday to uh, opt out of, of um, having uh, the cannabis stores in their communities. There's some interesting ones that did opt out. Brantford opted out, for example. Um, 
there's a couple other smaller communities. Uh, my my neck of the woods, uh, Emo, Ontario, opted out. I don't know why. Um, and there are some smaller communities that have opted out. And um, I think in any room you have different viewpoints about cannabis, right? Is it good? Is it bad? Um, there's There are probably a lot of people that think it's just bad. It's just a drug and it shouldn't be legalized. And there are others who have, may use it for medical purposes or may use it recreational for uh, just enjoyment. And uh, so you see that in any room. It's just sort of a, it's, it's a common, it's common to any room that you have a discussion on cannabis that you see a very wide range of viewpoints on it. And so that's what's happening around the municipalities. I don't know what's going to be challenged on that, but I suspect because we have one thing that we have ample supplies of in Ontario is lawyers, and uh, and may well be folks in uh, the city of Brantford will ch will challenge uh, the city of Brantford for prohibiting cannabis in their city. Um, and same thing in First Nations, if if uh, you decide and you can decide in law to prohibit cannabis, whether or not you will have folks challenging that decision, and vice versa. Allowing it in could also be challenged, um, but I really don't see the legal arguments there, because it's legal. So I'm just going to go through this list very quickly. Um, there, are, there are places where in law it says you can legally consume cannabis in your home. Uh, there's many outdoor public places. I don't know why there is such a big discussion about parks, but consuming cannabis in parks is legal. Um, hotels can have designated smoking rooms, therefore they can designate, uh, they can allow guests to smoke cannabis in those rooms. Of course, there's regulations around that. You have to make sure that it's fully enclosed and that it doesn't impact other guests. Um, Residential care facilities, I think this is really important for compassionate care. Residential care facilities also can designate spaces where you can use cannabis. Um, when you, I guess when you anchor your boat, um, is sort of as a, a place that you're going to sleep in, you can also use cannabis. And, uh, um, yeah, and there's also, of course, the, the smoking cannabis, uh, prohibitions uh, for operating motor vehicles and boats that we also have to be uh, concerned with. And then the next list is where you cannot use cannabis. So uh, workplaces, enclosed public spaces. You have to be aware if you're an employer about your occupational health and safety uh, obligations and responsibilities around cannabis. And cannabis is just another substance that you have to worry about as an employer, much like you had to worry about alcohol and other, uh, other drug use, anything that impairs. So, so your policy should just be about impairment and not coming to uh, work impaired. And also having to deal with the accommodation side if you do have employees who have uh, prescriptions for medical cannabis use. There's also some, some restrictions, may, maybe not as tight as, or as restrictive as we want it to be, but there are some restrictions around cannabis use around, around schools. Um, cannabis um, just basically follows the same type of uh, rules that existed for smoking cigarettes. You can't use it on patios, or you can't consume it. Of course, you can't consume it around children's playgrounds. Um, you can't consume it in the Rogers Center or other public sports areas, but for some reason there's an exception for golf courses. I don't know if there's some kind of connection between golf courses, golfers, and cannabis, but there you go. There is an exception. You can smoke and consume cannabis on golf courses while golfing. Maybe it improves your game. So I want to talk a bit about these dispensaries and I want to introduce the law about medical cannabis. Because of course cannabis use was in some limited ways um, legal to use if you had a prescription. And, uh, and that was because of the benefits of using medical cannabis for cer certain ailments 
and certainly for uh, those folks who are um, going through chemotherapy, um, some anxieties, I hear arthritis, CBD is very helpful. Um, so, and then also, why is this so attractive to so many First Nation entrepreneurs? Well, because there was no supply. There's, and there's a continuous supply issue. So, offering supply, cheaper prices, more variety, less restricted than, say, for example, provincial regulatory regimes. Your stores probably can look funner and uh, you can have more products in there because you're not regulated. Um, so all of those things happen. I think, I think really um, talking to people around economic development is it's First Nations providing the one-stop shop so that you get more traffic into the community for gas and foodstuffs and snacks and the cannabis that makes you want to buy more snacks. <laughs> so that's why dispensaries are quite lucrative at this time, it's because of the supply issue. Um, so uh, since, 20, since the, the mid, um, around 2010, we've had different, the opening of the door for medical cannabis. And in 2015, we, uh, we've seen this charter rights, of course, charter rights claims happen around medical cannabis because people are ill people are sick. So you can't really transpose these types of rulings around recreational cannabis because you're not talking about the same type of uh, charter values. In, 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 in the charter you're talking about section 7 and your physical integrity and your right to health, um, which is maybe coming along. Um, so the Smith decision um, Uh, created more more openings than, than was allowed in the regulations and allowed for um, not just using you know Health Canada, Canada licensed products but also using derivatives of those products. And in February 26th, is, and this was the this is the main um, issue of medical cannabis and dispensary is this Allard decision. In the Allard decision, um, a the person whose last name was Allard went to court and said. This is really expensive. Having me having to purchase all of my cannabis from a licensed producer, I don't know if you've seen the prices of cannabis, it's quite expensive, especially for medical use, um, because the standards are higher. It's really expensive, I should be able to grow my own plants. And the Supreme Court of Canada agreed. And so uh, what Canada did was they created new regulations, um, got new experts, and created uh, regulations that allowed for individuals to produce cannabis for their own personal use. And that they draw a big bright line around that, personal use. Not for commercial sale, but for personal use. And what happened was that there was some uh, folks in Vancouver who said, well, let's just take the next step. Let's just gather all these prescriptions in our dispensary and we will grow it for you for your personal use. This was not litigated. This was just a model created uh, by folks, entrepreneurial folks in Vancouver, now called the Vancouver model, where you have a dispensary that has sort of this um, group of prescriptions inside of it. So, and, and the person is producing cannabis and supplying cannabis for medical purposes to clients. This is not something that, it's not, a, it's not legal, but it also wasn't being enforced because we knew that legalization of recreational cannabis was just around the corner. And so the dispensaries started growing up in BC, they started coming up in different areas like Toronto, and then started growing up, literally, in First Nations. And so that's what we have now. The lack of enforcement because of legal recreational cannabis being just around the corner has created this misperception uh, that these dispensaries are somehow illegal. They are not. And the most important thing to, to know is that the, 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 the original legal rule that this all comes from is about people being able to grow their own cannabis for their own personal use. And there's a big jump that was taken by these dispensaries 
to take that legal rule to create something very, very different out of it. So, um, enforcement is the issue, and now that more policing, uh, police uh, organizations do have enforcement money to enforce Canada's Cannabis Act, as well as the provincial licensing regime, and all of the offenses underneath both, and there's many offenses under both laws, um, you are going to see enforcement because the resources are now there. And certainly the provinces want to protect their cash cow, which is the Ontario Cannabis Store. But there are still opportunities, and certainly to become a licensed producer is an economic opportunity that is still in front of First Nations. And I've heard some experts say, well, the licensing game was done last year. I don't think so. We see with the supply issue and the quality issue that there is still opportunity for First Nations to partner right and create licensed facilities with quality products, niche marketing, um, similar to um, basically microbreweries or creating micro cultivation or like wineries creating the whole experience because Ontario is also creating a, a law around consumption lounges not unlike the bars so bars where you consume alcohol consumption lounges for cannabis where you consume cannabis there are going to be legalized facilities um, in the future uh, much like bars for cannabis and so First Nations um, should also think about their own rules around consumption lounges. The other thing too is, is Health Canada has, again, they have a vested interest and want to make this regime work. So they've been really trying to work with First Nations to ensure that if they are interested in becoming a licensed producer, there is a uh, one person, a navigator that helps you. And a lot of people in the cannabis industry are very interested in this because um, under the general path to become a licensed producer it takes 24 months to maybe three years. And uh, with the navigator and all the resources trying to encourage First Nations, if the business is owned 51% by First Nations, you can get this license. Um, with everything else, all the other things uh, in place, you can get this license. Uh, under, under two years for sure. Um, those under lands management regimes will have an easier time. Those of us who have to deal with designations and you know, getting the one person that deals with designations and in the, in the Indigenous Service Office to, to schedule your designation tends to be the hold up. Um, so, this is again uh, the lawyer had coming on. Dispensaries are not um, legal. Um, and under the regulations in Ontario, if you want to become a licensed retail store, to get an authorization to have a retail store, uh, to have a license to open up a retail store, you cannot have a um, cannabis related offense uh, on your record. And you cannot, and you have to disclaim that you have not um, um, participated in the illicit market, meaning that you couldn't have been working or owning or participating in a dispensary uh, after October 17th. So that's a restriction that I've tried to get across to different dispensary owners, especially those folks that really believe in cannabis and really want to be involved in cannabis, um, not to uh, close the door on becoming a retail store licensee by uh, uh, the regulator knowing that you've been involved in the dispensary uh, after October 17th. So there's a bit of an amnesty, I guess, to the laws that I work with on um, with First Nations. I try to um, advise First Nations to share these common goals, and I think they are common goals for uh, human beings to around cannabis is to make sure it stays away from youth. There are extra considerations around youth and the development of the brain that uh, you want to keep cannabis away from them. Um, protecting public health and safety around cannabis. You don't want people to do things when they're impaired. Um, deterring criminal activity. There certainly is a lot of organized criminal activity around cannabis uh, uh, that 
needs to be dealt with, and uh, that's why we have, for example, a cannabis tracking system, so that we are making sure that the cannabis is totally accounted for and uh, not diverted into for illegal use. Um, of course, this uh, regime has been set in place without free station um, participation, very little consultation, <coughs> and uh, the excise tax issue is something that I know First Nation political leaders will bring up again and again. Um, the excise tax that, that is paid by all the licensed producers, which is a big bunch of money, um, is uh, shared, 75% uh, of that goes to the provinces in Canada, and 25% goes to Canada. And uh, the province has said that they're not going to share with First Nations. And Canada has said, well, the province should share with First Nations. And that's where we are on the excise tax issue and revenue sharing. So there are a lot of gaps to fill because um, when provinces and the federal government to get together, they always forget that First Nations have jurisdiction, First Nations have inherent rights, and First Nations have jurisdiction. And uh, so we have tax issues. Uh, we have jurisdictional issues, and um, we have a lot of confusion. And so, um, the Ontario Cannabis Store in on the province of Ontario says, if you want to buy cannabis, if you want to sell cannabis, you have to go to the Ontario Cannabis Store. They are the only wholesaler of cannabis. So, like when you want to sell alcohol at an event, where do you go? You have to go to the LCBO. So the Ontario Cannabis Store is the only place where you can buy legal cannabis. That's a problem. That's a big problem. And uh, First Nations might try to challenge this by maybe work working together to create their own First Nation cannabis wholesaler. Not unlike what some folks have tried to do around tobacco is to have a wholesaler go around and bring cannabis supplies to different First Nation stores and, uh, and as, as the legal wholesaler. It's, it'll be a challenging um, jurisdictional uh, problem, but it's something that I'm sure First Nations are thinking about. And then the regulations themselves, and this is, this is basically a current update on discussions I've been having with the province, they know there are tax issues um, because um, if First Nations do have stores, product is delivered to a First Nation, um, there's no reason why it should be a, a tax product. And there's no reason why the First Nation should be um, responsible for collecting tax on one product. So um, they're trying to work with First Nations that are considering or considering either licensing their own store or working with Ontario to have some kind of co-license of a store to have the same price point as other stores. Now, if any of you are having these kind of discussions around tobacco, you know how sort of nonsensical that is. You want me to bargain away the competitive advantage my store is going to have with the neighboring municipality store by saying that we're going to charge some kind of tax or we're gonna collect some kind of tax. Doesn't make any sense. Um, any other an economic center being wouldn't do that. So why are they expecting First Nations to do that as well? It uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. We know from the other legalized regimes like Colorado that it's the vape pens and the edibles and the extracts that really is where the money is at the end of the day. So these things are being legalized. Can there be a, you know, one last push by First Nations to make sure that First, First Nations have more opportunity in these areas? Um, I don't know what's going on politically there, but if I was advising First Nations, I would be saying that there are probably some, um, some entry points here to talk about um, edibles and to talk about piloting certain types of edibles to uh, create an advantage for First Nations and market opportunity. The other thing that I want to make First Nations aware of is that if your economic development board is funding a dispensary, be very, very careful because there are a lot of um, 
very expensive offense, uh, fines related to offenses in, in uh, dealing with illicit cannabis. So again, I, I think that there's still opportunity for uh, licensed production of cannabis. This is where the good jobs, the major investment is. And um, around recreational cannabis, it could be cultivation and even micro-cultivation of cannabis. And this is all regulated by Health Canada. I have often tried to persuade Canada to set up special rules for First Nations um, and to co-develop special rules for First Nations, especially around micro-cultivation. And um, they're listening, but they're not saying yes yet. But we're continuing to talk. Uh, processing, of course, with the extracts. There is a lot of opportunities. Just the extract industry itself is is um, being looked at. Um, there's a lot of former, or there's a lot of licensed producers that are looking at just divesting of that production facility and just getting into the extract business because it's so lucrative. Um, there's also the uh, packaging. There's a, there's a lucrative industry in packaging. So if any of you have a shutdown pulp and paper mill nearby, you might actually look at looking at. Uh, some of these packaging, interesting packaging developments uh, uh, with uh, wood fiber. And um, there's, of course, opportunities for First Nations to establish their own jurisdiction for retail sales because I, I would make arguments um, that the Ontario law doesn't apply. And I'll, I'll share some of those arguments with you in a second. But uh, the big opportunity is quality. What I've been hearing, and I've been trying on social media and other places, podcasts and whatnot, to hear what consumers are saying about cannabis, and they're saying, the OCS does not sell good weed. And uh, that's a problem. Um, there are people complaining about the quality, people are complaining about the distribution process, because of course, it has to go from a licensed producer, to a wholesaler, to the consumer. Then, um, after April 1, it's gonna have to go from a licensed producer to a wholesaler to a store and then to the consumer, um, mold is an issue. And uh, so, and you definitely uh, don't want to be smoking if you have molding because it's gonna, the mold's gonna get into your lungs. So there's those types of health concerns, um, consumer concerns and quality concerns. And so quality is going to be the long-term strategy for anybody getting involved in cannabis. Um, and there's also, don't just do it, because if you just do it, you're going to run a foul. It's the Shoppers Drug Mart recently. I don't know if you've seen any of the ads for Shoppers Drug Mart. They sell medical cannabis now, online, and they've been advertising. Um, somebody should tell them that there are a lot of restrictions around advertising of cannabis. And so, they've made mistakes as well. Even big companies can make, make mistakes. So here's a... a some information from Ontario about the licenses involved in opening up a store. You have to uh, get a retail operator license. You also have to uh, go through the process, which is not unlike opening up a uh, licensed uh, restaurant. You have to do the public notice. You have to tell the local government. Um, uh, and, and you have to have the public comment period. It's actually very short for cannabis stores. Uh, I think it's 15 days and um, then you get your authorization to open the store in that location. Um, and then you, your manager also has to be licensed and trained to operate a retail venture store. These are not expensive, inexpensive licenses, $4,000, $6,000 are the licenses. Um, those lucky 25 or unlucky 25 that got the uh, opportunity under the lottery actually had to put a $50,000 lot of credit and they will lose that line of credit if their store doesn't open uh, by April 30th, uh, 2019. So it's expensive. Um, it's not it's not for your hippie uncle to get involved in. Let's say your hippie, hippie uncle has a heck of a lot of money. So the ministries that are involved is the Minister of Finance, um, something that you folks might know is Mick Fidelli. Uh, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, that's my local MP back in Fort Francis, or Kenora, uh, Greg Rickford, and then the Attorney General of Ontario. Um, somebody that I've found is very pleasant is uh, um, 
Minister Mulroney. So these are the three ministers, and they're not. There's not any lead. I've done calls where all three ministers are on the phone uh, with the First Nation and, um, and getting their direct, giving their direction on this. And um, this is the opportunity under the cannabis legislation in Ontario. Is Section 44 sub 1 is that Ontario can make arrangements and agreements with First Nations to harmonize First Nation jurisdiction with Ontario jurisdiction to create a store that sells Ontario cannabis products. So that's a possibility. Hasn't been done yet, um, but uh, that's something I'm certainly working on. So um, standards is the key. So First Nations that are looking at your own cannabis control is to ensure that you're adopting similar like standards uh, that Health Canada has for cultivation and production, um, distribution, and also uh, province-like standards for uh, stores and for training and for prohibitions uh, and regulations, uh, much like Ontario has. Why do we have to worry about that? In the 1980s, the Supreme Court of Canada had envisioned First Nation reserves as federal enclaves. There's a bunch of decisions in the 1980s that said that provincial law does not exist here. here the federal section 9124, Indians and lands reserved for Indians means this is a place of only federal law. And there are actually some good Supreme Court of Canada judgments around that. But since that, there has been an evolution away, allowing more and more provincial law in. And I know a lot of people look at the Chilcot and decision and say, yay, Aboriginal title. But there's actually a lot of discussion in this case about the provincial jurisdiction to regulate Aboriginal title. Think about that for a second. The province doesn't own the land. It's owned by a First Nation or Indigenous nation. But the province could regulate on that land. That's craziness. But that's what the Supreme Court of Canada believes in Chilicotin. And there was strong uh, discussion in, by the litigators in this case, in this appeal case, that you know, we're arguing for this uh, doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity. If there are two laws, one federal and one provincial, the federal law prevails. It's not, what, not unlike what we do with Indian Act bylaws. The federal law prevails. And Supreme Court of Canada said, no, no, that's not how it works. We're, we live in a very complex society. Both governments do government a little bit different. The province is better at some things. The province is better at civil rules, civil order. So we need to make sure that there are provincial rules let in on First Nation Reserve as well. And so the traffic, the traffic uh, laws are let in. Um, drinking and driving laws, of course, the criminal code, um, but some of the provincial laws are in around the Highway Traffic Act, um, and there's a there's a rule basically of its own force. The provincial law applies of its own force because your First Nation lands are in the province of Ontario. Certain laws, for example, maybe some smoking prohibitions. Maybe, I say maybe because it's stuff that gone, has gone to board. Um, maybe some cannabis law. <coughs> maybe some rules around illicit, illicit cannabis. Um, maybe their Employment Standards Act. Maybe other things. That the province just does better in the circumstances of specific cases. And so that's problematic. Another thing that's problematic in all of these folks that say, we have sovereignty, we should just fight, we should just challenge that, not only that the provincial law doesn't apply in our First Nation, but federal law also doesn't apply. Again, this sort of, this, this commitment to the fact that we're lawless. How many people know that, know people that drive on the reserve that don't have licenses? This is this argument that we're lawless. 
Um, so the sovereignty argument. Provincial law, in some instances, does apply of its own force on reserve. And that's if you don't do something. You need to exercise governance. You need to, as I've heard uh, my friends in, in your communities say, you must cover the field or occupy the field. And that's what you need to do. And we've tried to do that. And this is this case in Penajuan. Of course, my friends in Eagle Lake, uh, Gardner. Uh, so Penajuan and Gardner went to the Supreme Court of Canada thinking that Section 35 allowed for the right of self-government and litigated this, not knowing that at the same time the Supreme Court of Canada was fashioning this awful test about Section 35 Aboriginal rights called Van Der Peet, where you had this three-part test where you have to prove that you have an Aboriginal right to do something, including self-government. And you have to prove, you have to connect it way back to when the Europeans came here. And that's really expensive and really crazy and frankly, <coughs> racism. And it's problematic. But this is what we have um, in ca Canadian law. This is not Indigenous law. This is Canadian law about how we must prove that we have the Aboriginal right to regulate something. It's unfortunate, but that's what's in Canadian law. And we need to push the boundaries. There are other tools, Section 81 of the Indian Act, and of course there is still um, ways that you can occupy the field using this, the Indian Act, and that's by creating a Section 81 bylaw. And I've done that for some First Nation clients um, to, uh, to establish a cannabis control bylaw. And that's a possibility. And the great thing about Section 81 bylaws is you don't need the minister to approve these things anymore. You need to post it on your website or post it publicly or gazette it in the First Nation Gazette in order for it to be uh, become law, law, law of your First Nation Reserve. There's also ways to prohibit, and uh, there's a problem not of our own making. Um, Canada is of the position that, uh, because if you read the French version of the Indian Act or the French translation of the Indian Act under Section 85.1, um, clearly, the Indian Act is only talking about alcohol. I, I don't care about the French version of the Indian Act. I think that we should have the right to prohibit things if we decide as a government and a community that governs ourselves to prohibit something, we should be able to prohibit it. And, uh, and that's what's happening. There are First Nations who have, through uh, bylaws and also through BCRs, because there's a way working with Ontario that you can simply send a BCR to the Attorney General to the Ontario Cannabis Store where the Ontario Cannabis Store will be restricted uh, from sending any cannabis products to your community and that's through, through the mail and the uh, AGCO, the regulator, will honour that BCR and say we will not license the store in that community if there's a BCR on record. And that, that had no deadline. You can, you can decide to do that tomorrow, you can decide to do that next year um, but you're going to have problems regarding a store in your community that's licensed. So that's, that's uh, two different ways to prohibit cannabis. And of course there's the uh, awesome process of exercising inherent jurisdiction. That's, um, I don't do this enough, but I love doing this work. It's helping First Nations exercise their inherent jurisdiction and uh, proving um, through community consultation of I've uh, gone to community meetings and I've helped uh, First Nations walk through community meetings um, to prove that they have uh, the community support in controlling cannabis on the First Nation and regulating cannabis. And uh, we walked through those processes and an exercise of inherent jurisdiction and consulted other governments, namely Canada and Ontario, and said, we're doing this, you can work with us or not work with us, but we're doing this. And of course, um, our invitations to meet as ministers, generally, uh, we get the invitation and to talk about the exercise of the jurisdiction and how Ontario and the First Nation can work together and how the First Nation in Canada can work together. And so my arguments about 
provincial law not just of its own force um, being the law of on your First Nation Reserve. And that's because, A, if you do something, if you say that you have the jurisdiction to do something and you've already done it and covered the field, then why would another government be able to overtake that? The second is, the provincial government will say, well, there's also Section 88 of the Indian Act, which means that um, as long as it's a law of general application, it should apply. So cannabis is a law of general application. We're not saying specifically about Indians, but we're saying it's for everybody. The problem is Section 88 um, talks about Indians, but it doesn't talk about the other part of Section 90, 9124 of the Division of Powers, which is lands. And you can make, and I have made arguments that cannabis control in Ontario is all about geography. You decide where the stores are going to be. You decide about distances of stores from schools. It's all about geography. It's all about Indian land, in that case, and the way that they regulate cannabis. Therefore, you cannot use Section 88 to resuscitate an Ontario law and say it applies on a provincial, on a federal uh, First Nation reserve. So that's, that's just some of the back and forth that we have at government to government tables around jurisdiction. Final slide. Going forward. There is a lot of people talking about cannabis and the windfall around cannabis. That happened last year in the stock market. And of course, you've heard that some of the windfalls were quickly uh, turned back and, and the cannabis stocks went, um, went quite low. Um, there, there, there's definitely an investment opportunity for cannabis that has happened and will continue to happen. Uh, but you do that with um, strong expertise about investments um, and advice on investments. Certainly there was that. There are opportunities um, to compete on quality and compete on location for different First Nations, and that's great. And, and again, strong advice is needed. Get good advice, get, do good research. Um, but don't fall for those get-rich-quick people that are coming to you and saying, you're in the land of the lawless. Let's open up a store and do lawless things. Don't do that. Because it's only going to hurt your community. And there are a lot of, and there's too many people doing that right now. Don't do it, don't fall for it. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and honor. Thank you. We've got time for question and answer, and I'll give you my first question. And uh, it's kind of related to uh, issues that's going on in some of our communities here. Um, I guess uh, anecdotally, there was a meeting with Canadian officials and uh, Ontario provincial, provincial uh, officials in Tainanega. And the question was raised whether uh, what can the province and the feds do to help the community uh, work through some of their lawlessness uh, in terms of shops establishing. I think we're starting to see it in some of our communities as well. What's your advice on how to regulate that ourselves? Because we do have the right to regulate in our communities and you know we may not have the frameworks but you know just basic uh, you know trying to establish uh, you know commercial uh, licenses and that sort of thing to regulate in some way sometimes goes by the wayside by entrepreneurs and other outside influencers that want to establish. So what's your advice on how to get a handle on the, that kind of situation? So there, there are some dispensaries that are open as dispensaries because the folks involved in it would never get licensed. So I just want to say that at the outset. And I'm not saying that to disparage any of the characters involved because there are also some really great people that are involved. But there are folks involved in some of these dispensaries um, that did go not to the community to a community member who may have um, some CP or allotted land to, you know, to privately open up a store, and they, and they, you know, willingly went along and uh, using someone else's money and opened up a store, and are basically reselling a bunch of Colorado product, are reselling a lot of BC product. Um, that's not really well regulated. There's a lot of black market product inside some of these stores, and that's not safe for your community. 
Um, so regulation is important, but it should be your First Nation that's doing it. I've been working with different communities, including Kaya Danega, about cannabis control and creating rules for cannabis control and having a strong engagements with Ontario and Canada about unpacking their rules and saying, no, this, this is important to, you know, generally to the industry, but what, what we're trying to do is create more opportunity. So let's talk about this rule here. This rule creates an inferior product. And we know this because we do have expertise in some of the First Nations communities. So we're creating rules that are fashioned so that there is opportunity for the First Nation to safely regulate cannabis um, in a way that actually produces higher quality cannabis. And that's some of the discussions we've been having with Ontario in, in Canada. And I just started working for a BC First Nation. And of course, the NDP BC government is much more friendly. And being able to take some of that information back to Ontario and say, oh, BC's doing this, and it's better for First Nation. So all that is to say is to get some expert opinions Basically, don't go to any kind of gunfight without ammunition. And bring that ammunition, like do the legwork and, and get the ammunition so that you're creating opportunity for the entire community. Um, the dispensaries, um, like I said, there are some people who really believe in medical cannabis. And we've also been working with Health Canada. I don't know if you've known this, but Health Canada actually was trying to work with the pharmacies to open up retail cannabis for medical. Uh, retail uh, facilities in the pharmacies across Canada for medical cannabis and the pharmacists at the time said no, we don't want that. That's not something we believe in. <laughs> and so that medical cannabis dispensary element, the retail element, was uh, pushed aside and that's why all these licensed producers sell online directly to the, the client because of that one discussion where the pharmacies for whatever reason said no. So my discussions with Health Canada is, well, there are First Nations who strongly support medical cannabis for so many reasons, from you know, the opioid issues to the fact that a lot of our younger people are going to self-medicate through cannabis. And better than going through a medical cannabis facility than just going to a retail facility and taking the wrong stuff. They're using it for a purpose to get um, advice from somebody like a pharmacist. And there are that, that discussion is actually going on too. The, the idea of Canada licensing First Nation facilities to sell at the retail um, level medical cannabis. Hi Sarah, it's good to see you again. Nice you. Um, I know from the Southeast region, a lot of members that have dispensaries set up, they're um, going under the UNDRIP section three, which is, um, Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination, which includes political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. So, so is that a personal right or a collective right? Because a lot of them are riding on that uh, Article 3. So, so you'll, I can actually send you some information on how, say, uh, some, some of the experts around uh, the UN Declaration have interpreted that right. And um, especially to, um, at, at the discussion where we were trying to get Canada and Australia and the other community, other states to opt in, was the fact that this, that what they were afraid of was exactly that kind of argument that's happening from those private individuals. Um, and, and so there are, like James Anaya is one of the experts I can think of, who's written some, at least one article I can think of about this being a collective, very much a collective right. And actually his argument is it's probably not the individual bands, but probably the larger uh, indigenous nation that, that determines those types of uh, um, sort of larger governance issues. And so um, I've, I've read closely in detail like the NIMCA type of arguments about, uh, about um, Self, uh, self-regulation, meaning I, I'm, I'm in an industry, the lawyers, we're self-regulating. We have our own society, we make up our own rules, and when we're in conflict, we decide, you know, the penalties. That actually doesn't seem very fair, doesn't it? 
Um, but the law society does that, and we do that. We're self-regulated. The dispensaries are actually asking, are saying that they should be self-regulated too, meaning that they should decide what their rules are. Um, they're gonna look out for you. You know, I've 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 heard those kind of promises before. I don't trust that. I think that there's a role for government. There's a role for governance, and I strongly believe in First Nation governance and that we've always done this and we should be doing it. And we de definitely should be governing um, over any store in our communities. We should be setting rules so that we protect you and uh, you know that that poor um, youth that's going to run into product that's not safe for them. Yeah. And one more quick one. one. A lot of our um, members, I know, um, they're trying to compare uh, tobacco sales. You mentioned tobacco with dispensaries being set up, but a big difference is for um, where First Nations allow tobacco sales by a retailer, the retailer has to have a small business license in order to purchase from a wholesale. That, that's how they get the allocations for tobacco sales. So, um, and um, the allocations do have that stamp on it that they're allowed to sell from the, that allocation. National brands, I'm talking. You know, it don't matter about the other brands, but national brands, your Export Aid, Warrior Aid, whatever, but um, you, uh, the retailer has to have a small business license in order to order them. So, you know, that's not com completely understood by some of the dispensaries either, so. Yeah, so there's two conversations that can happen sort of on the regional level for First Nations, and that is to talk to the province or talk to Canada um, about changing that section 69 and saying that First Nations can regulate and can have their own retail seal. And you can utilize that as a government, that retail seal, much like you utilize the quotas in tobacco to regulate and enforce, because there's definitely an enforcement issue with cannabis, you can enforce um, the, the business owners from complying with certain things. And so that retail seal, you'll see it on, uh, if you buy something from Ontario Cannabis Store, you see the provincial, it's basically the Trillium, the Ontario Trillium. Um, policing and enforcement agencies are looking for that retail seal to show that it's legal cannabis. Um, so First Nations should be lobbying uh, Canada to have a First Nation retail seal so that First Nations actually can utilize that as a tool to, to get compliance with their own rules and regulations for the health and safety of uh, the consumers. Hi, uh, my question is about First Nation liability. And a couple of years ago when you know, this was still being developed and we weren't aware of the uh, legislation, we had the uh, regional grand chief, uh, I mean the regional chief Isidore Day come and do a presentation for us. And he shared with us some of the issues about um, legal liability that, that um, our communities were looking at. And one of the examples that were shared was, the, let's say for an example, um, a dispensary on reserve uh, was you know, selling cannabis products and had a, um, made up a form of uh, health conditions and, and people were asked to you know, turn off any illnesses that they may have. And uh, of course there are no standardized forms for this and there also is, uh, isn't a, a protected confidential database. So the issue was that let's say somehow somebody's private confidential health information became public. Maybe they said something like they, uh, maybe they indicated you know, HIV status or something like that. One of the things that was shared with us that not only could that individual sue that dispensary for breach of confidentiality, but that they could also sue the First Nation, that we were also liable even if we did not have any um, um, revenue benefit from that business, that was a private little business. And so I'm wondering if you can comment on that and if that's still a, a possibility. Um, I think practically, that practically, I'm just trying to think about the law involved here, practically that would be a hard, um, uh, that would be hard to do because you basically there's there's a legal rule called causation, so you would have to you would have to connect the dots between whatever harm happened, and um, I don't know what the harm would be, but whatever harm would be created, and and 
the inaction of the First Nation government. Um, so you see this, you see this in tobacco litigation. Um, I've looked at a lot of tobacco litigation and some of the advice I've been giving to First Nations about licensing cannabis because it's kind of um, two sides of the same coin. So in licensing cannabis, are you creating, um, are you creating obligations for the First Nations to create certain, are you insuring the consumer in some way? And so that's some of the things, the advice I give uh, to First Nation governments about making sure that you're giving no warranties, you know, the language around the licenses, all of that has to be prepared by a lawyer uh, in order to protect and basically do risk management. So if you are actually governing, you should have, you know, I, I know there are lots and lots of people that create <laughs> nice policy, but there's, there's a reason that we exist as lawyers is that we protect your interests and we can protect your, um, you from being sued. And certainly uh, the First Nation clients that I've been working with are risk averse and they don't want to uh, be doing something that puts, uh, puts um, the community in jeopardy of being sued. So we've been making sure that we are, making sure that the uh, licensing is done properly, the wording is, is uh, crafted, there's all kinds of terms of art that you have to be using to order to protect against liability. So we're doing all those things, and that's really important. The, other, the final thing I want to say about dispensaries is, the, the question you should ask them, it's a very simple one. Are you a medical or are you a recreational cannabis store? Because you cannot be both. Are you a recreational or medical cannabis store? Most of them say will say that they're both, but you cannot legally be both. There's no such thing as a medical cannabis store. You buy medical cannabis online, and if you're a recreational cannabis store, um, where do you where where do you get your authorization from? Because otherwise, under the criminal code and the cannabis act, it's illegal. You need to be licensed. So, by someone. All right. Good question. A round of applause for Sarah Main. <laughs> Sarah not only 